What an absolute honor it is to, of course, kick off a brand new property with one of our own. And I say that because, look, at the end of the day, I'm not going to mince my words. I'm a huge RCB fan. And this man was not just our coach, but he was our doc. And I say doc, the director of cricket, maybe director of operations. You never know. I'm talking about Mike Hessen, who sits quietly somewhere in New Zealand. How are we? I'm very good, thanks, Avanash. Uh, looking forward to having a chat. Yeah, before we go forward, I know all the cricketers that I've interviewed normally call me Avinash. Can we call me Avinash, please? Avanish, I can do that, no worries. It's easy. Super Mike, generally, how are we? And uh, 2024, what's been up? Yeah, I've spent a bit of time at home, which has been nice. Uh, quite a lot of TV work, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of interviews, a bit of, bit of business work, which I've enjoyed. and. I've also signed up with Islamabad United as well um, to be the head coach uh, for the PSL. So looking forward to that. And uh, yeah, started working with Geo Cinema um, and TV side of things. So I'll be coming over for the IPL and doing uh, yeah doing some work there. So looking forward to that. I ask you so many things, not just RCB related, but player topics, and of course a little bit about you as well. Let's start there in terms of your childhood back in the sheep country, New Zealand. And I was actually doing some research. Just want to go straight up off the bat. I know your parents were divorced, Mike. How was that in terms of building you as a person, as a teenager? Uh, look, my parents divorced when I was when I was really young. I think I was three, maybe three and a half. So it was kind of all I knew. Um, you know, I knew you had two different homes. They were, you know, I was lucky I had two loving homes. Um, parents both worked. Um, you know, my mother travelled a lot with her work. She was a, uh, a management consultant around the world. My father was a, um, an engineer. So he um, and I, I lived with with both both families. They both remarried. Um, and yeah, look, I had a I had a good upbringing, but I had an upbringing where um, you know we had a lot of time by ourselves to get out and do what we wanted to do. Um, you know, my brother was a became a chef at a very young age because you know he had to start cooking. For us, uh, when we were really young, because mum was away working all the time, so you know we became self-sufficient and we became uh, we, we get we're allowed plenty of time to go and follow our dreams as well, which was which was nice. But the age of twenty-one, correct me if I'm wrong, you just took into this role that you're currently right now playing as well. Yeah, I, I mean, I went to England, uh, you know, with the dream of being a professional cricketer. Uh, I went over there and, and played for three seasons. You know, I did pretty well in my last year. I got 10 hundreds um, and I was, you know, I came back with the intent to sort of carry on that dream and, and be a professional cricketer. Um, but I had some, I had some back issues, which, you know, were sort of ongoing. Um, and I was offered a really great opportunity uh, to be director of cricket at, at Otago Cricket, which was one of the, the six um, provinces in New Zealand. Uh, it was by far the smallest. And I was probably 20 years younger than, than the next person doing the role that I was. So, you know, I was lucky enough to get that opportunity and, and I, I thrive with that responsibility. Um, you know, I got plenty of experience, made a lot of mistakes um, and and learned a heck of a lot in those sort of seven years I was doing that role. Talk to me about Argentina. How was Ricardo? Yeah, well, it was it was an interesting one. I just got married um, and it was, I'd been in that director of coaching role for, for seven or eight years and, and I wanted to, I wanted to be a head coach. Um, I was contacted by the ICC and said, look, we've got this this job in Argentina to come over and uh, it's a, I think it was a six or nine month contract, uh, come over and prepare the side for the America's Cup. You know, different language, different uh, country. I was in a job that I could have probably been in for another 20 years uh, because I was pretty successful at it. But I did want to take myself out of my comfort zone. When English is the second language, you have to find other methods. Uh, and I, I absolutely loved it. We did really well. We went to the uh, the America's Cup that year. Uh, we had a couple of wins, which were their first wins ever um, at that level, and it was a great experience and and one that uh, certainly helped shape me. Uh, and we'll come to your Kenyan encounters, but essentially, even in Argentina, you were in a rough neighbourhood. Oh, we were in a really nice neighbourhood, but unfortunately, there was a I think there was a, a kidnapping on you know most corners most most weeks. So. Uh, we had to be pretty careful around that. I think it's probably because we were living in an affluent area. And uh, But I, I never really felt 
that unsafe. Um, you don't want to be around football games and be wearing the wrong shirt. But outside of that, I felt pretty safe. Did that make you a Messi fan then? Yeah, I, well, I was actually a La Boca fan uh, at the time, which was, uh, you know, them against River Plate was the local the local derby. And um, it was, yeah, it was intense, let's put it that way. It's crazy because you've gone to Kenya then, and I know Kenya has a little bit of a cricket history, of course, that 2003 World Cup semi-finals that they made and so on and so forth. But again, you find yourself in precarious situations where you're held on point. How did you manage to tackle yourself out of that? Uh, uh, it was probably worse for my family because, you know, I was often away touring and, and some of our, our issues happened well. Um, you know, Kate, uh, my wife, was back in, with, the, with the two girls in Nairobi. So um, that was probably worse because it made you feel helpless. Once again, I, I loved my time there. Um, the players were, were great. Um, they are hugely passionate. Uh, but the country was going through a little bit of turmoil at the time, you know, from a terrorist point of view. And unfortunately, you know, we, we had to choose a time to, to get out. Um, and we headed back to New Zealand and you know, I guess on to our next chapter. Did you actually shit yourself at times thinking, oh, my God, my life's at stake here. I should really walk out of this country. Oh, there was a couple of times before my family arrived that I'm thinking, what have I done here? I mean, my very first day I was, you know, I had policemen, you know, knock on my door and point the gun at me and wanted to get in the car and, and take me down the road and, and get some money out of me. Um, and, you know, you turn up at the ground and that. Some of the players say, well, you know, you shouldn't let them in the in the car with you. And so, well, mate, the guy's pointing a gun at me. You know, I'm not really in a strong position here to say yay or nay, you know. So um, so you kind of do as you're told. But I guess if you grow up in that environment, you maybe you're a little bit more savvy. But uh, I was, yeah, I was <laughs> just making sure I survived, really. Were you ever bullied as a kid? Uh, not really. Um, and I was I was actually really fortunate because I had an elder brother who was much bigger than I was, and he was he went to a different school and he played um, you know he played basketball and volleyball and and he was friends with a lot of kids at my school the older boys, and uh, I remember the very first day of high school and and a couple of couple of the bigger boys came over and I think they were going to just try and you know give me a wee bit of a reminder who's in charge and. I remember them, they grabbed hold of my tie and just as they did, these two big fellas came over the back and, and grabbed them and said, you know, do you know who this boy's brother is? Uh, don't touch him. And, uh, yeah, I was always pretty grateful for my brother at that time that, um, you know, I was, the, the boys, the, the message pretty much got through that he's, um, yeah, be very careful. Yeah, I mean, God bless you. And, of course, now everything's kind of gone swimmingly well for you. You were New Zealand's longest serving coach. Take me back to the morning of the World Cup final 2015, Mike. And what was the chat in the dressing room? Because Australia and New Zealand, no one needs telling what kind of rivalry that is. But what was the chat in particular from you and Brendan McCollum to the boys that day? Everybody in that group was highly passionate about, you know, performing well for New Zealand. And, um, you know, the fact that the four or five days leading up to that were pretty special. Um, obviously, first time New Zealand had ever made a World Cup final. Um, it was, you know, that was a special time. There were a lot of New Zealand fans coming over, um, you know, to the MCG. There was a lot of talk in the media about, wow, how big the MCG is. Um, and, you know, we were just, we we're sort of just laughing it off, really, in terms of we played Australia plenty of times the, the previous two or three years. We'd done well against them. And, you know, we just tried to keep things pretty similar um, as we had for the, the previous couple of months. So, um, you know, we look back in hindsight, and, you know, I remember talking with Brendan afterwards and uh, and he sort of, he's talked about, you know, he, he wished he'd watched the ball more, but, um, and that was, you know, probably just a personal thing. And maybe from a coaching point of view, maybe I, I needed to remind him just to watch the ball. But to be fair, the previous games, we've pretty much just talked about going out and, and taking the game on and, and that certainly had served us incredibly well leading up to then. You mentioned previous games there, I have to ask you, Grant Elliott, whacking deal staying out of Eden Park it was I think and uh, propelling you all to the final. What were the first words to come out of your mouth in the dressing room? You can swear if you have to. <laughs> um, to be fair, we were just cuddling. It, you know, there was just 
pure emotion and yelling and screaming and, and it was just it was just yeah pure emotion I mean, grant got more hugs than he'll, he'll ever get uh in that one day i think he was our best i think we talk about him being the best uh our best ever import um you know he you know he wasn't in the team a year before that and uh you know we'd sort of brought him back and and he wanted to prove a point and, and we'd you know we'd looked after grant as well you know grant had had a few things happening leading up to the world cup you know from a, a family perspective and he'd spent the day before on the bowling machine practicing the i guess the the slog sweep from a length off the seamers and uh and he was hitting those out of the screw so he obviously decided that was his best option but oh we just we just sat there in quiet for a bit just stared at each other and just thought one more game to go you know we've achieved something special but um Oh, there was, I'm sure there was plenty of swearing and woohoos and whatever, but I can't quite recall exactly what it was. Mike, what has been your biggest regret as an international cricket coach? I mean, obviously not getting across the final line in 2015, but surely there were a couple of other ones that stood out for you. Talk to me. Yeah, I, look, I think um, I think the Ross Taylor situation was always was always a really difficult one. Um, and I, I think, you know, I've, I've thought about that, you know, at the time, it was a, it was a pretty challenging time. Uh, and I've, I've thought about it a lot in terms of, you know, how, how potentially that, that could be managed better. But um, there wasn't a lot of support there, to be fair. Um, and it was, it was kind of like, look, we're, we're really battling as a team and you go in and do what's required. But, but when you make the tough calls, there's not a lot of, not a lot of backing. Uh, but I was really lucky that the board and the CEO were very supportive around the fact we needed to make some change. But outside of that, there weren't too many people putting their nose up and uh, or putting their hand up and saying, yep, great call. That's insane, honestly. Like, I'm just trying to think about it and whether the dressing room was on side and they were on board with that particular decision. But look, it's gone on and life happens and every decision kind of has its own way. Coming to the IPL then, and let's get juicy and let's get talking. Right now. I'll start with the King's Lemon Punjab. I have to ask, how that all went about. Was it as simple as Preeti Zinta be like, hi, Mike, we've heard about you. I know you've coached New Zealand. Can you just come here and do his job? Was it as simple as that? Uh, well, it was the CEO uh, who called me up. It wasn't, wasn't one of the owners and, and just said, look, would I be interested in the role? Um, at that time, I didn't, have, uh, I didn't have an agent. So I was sort of contacted directly. And um, I'd literally just, just finished with, with New Zealand. So I was, you know, doing some TV work with Star, you know, the best time to take over a team is often when they're, they're battling. And, you know, I guess that's probably if you look back through my career, you know, I took over Otago. They hadn't won a title for 20 years. You know, we won, we won a few. Um, obviously, New Zealand was similar. Um, you know, we'll go into RCB in a moment. But I guess that's part of my strength is, is coming in and identifying what's working and what's not. So uh, with Punjab, yeah, it was – my first time to, to head to an auction and get around a table and, and do some mock auctions and try and develop a strategy around building a team. And I certainly look forward to that. Be honest with me. You just said yeah, the CEO called you. How tough Actually, actually you... sorry to interrupt. Um, Ashwin rang me first. Ravi Chandra and Ashwin. Yeah, he rang. He rang first. So I'd, I'd had a bit to do with Ash, uh, obviously, in New Zealand-India series. So um, Ash actually rang and asked me if I was interested. And, and then, obviously, he passed that on to the, the CEO. So one second, Ravi Chand Ashwin was basically your agent here to get into the IPL. Well, I wouldn't say he was my agent. He was captain, so he was obviously keen to have someone that he wanted to work with. So, you know, whether he had the influence to, I guess he's just sounding me out. And I guess if he's going to recommend somebody to the board, he, he probably wants to have a chat to them and firstly find out if they're interested or available. And secondly, work out if they've got similar values and, and a, I guess a vision of where they want to take the team. So... I wouldn't say he was the one that offered me the job, but he was certainly the first point of contact. You're a really sweet guy, and you're so diplomatic. And every time I ask you anything, you're just like, oh, there were a bunch of uh, really good lads, and they're good lads. Come on. Surely not everyone's a good lad. Surely not every dressing room is a good space to be in. You must have gone in there and be like, hold on. How the hell are things working here? I have to really grab the bull by its horn, so to speak, and show them how it's done. Oh, there's always a balancing act, isn't there? I mean, I, I think there's no doubt I've got a I've got a side to me that doesn't suffer fools, uh, and I don't. I certainly don't uh, go into a changing room and think that it's going to be great straight away. But 
I think with any team, like cricket tends to weed out um, dickheads. Like they, they tend to get moved on. Like you, you're with each other all the time. You're in the changing room all the time. You actually have to buy into a team philosophy or else you've got to be incredibly good. You know, when you've got you've got people who can get a little bit caught up in their own their own selves and their own ego around scoring runs or, or bowling from the right end or their figures at the end of the game rather than necessarily the outcome of the game. So, you know, one of my focuses every team I go into is is putting context around performance and, and how much have you actually done to help us win the game. And that's something that I, I bring to every team. And, and Punjab is no different. Is it different methods for different players? One needs a carrot and stick. One needs a arm around the shoulder. One needs a right telling off. Did you absolutely give it to any of the players? Come on, spill the beans. Oh, there was there was one there was one game um, that I felt in the field we we were very passive, and I think the one thing I I don't like or tolerate or or, or should is a team going out there and, and being passive and, and not really getting stuck in. And and there was a game, you know, in, in Mahali. It was, it was an important game, but it was it was a, a, a game that we didn't necessarily have to win to stay in the tournament. And we were we were passive. And uh, I do remember in the changing room reminding people that this is just not the way we operate. Like, if this is the way you want to operate, this is not the team for you. Um, but every player you need to have those relationships with. Um, you know, Chris Gale um, was was there. I'd never worked with Chris. So I'd sort of always heard, you know, people in the media had talked about how hard work he was, whatever. I thought he was outstanding. And, and he was a real team man. You know, he, sure, he loved to sleep, but whenever he turned up to a team meeting, he was fully engaged. He offered to the young players. Um, you know, he was really honest around his, his injuries. I do recall one time where, unfortunately, we... We couldn't pick him because his back was injured and we managed to get a win and and he managed to find himself on the dance floor that night at about two o'clock in the morning and he seemed fine but uh, i think he operates best in darkness you know he loves the dark and um you know <laughs> the daylight he loves to sleep so um but i thought chris was outstanding to that group and, and even that was towards the back end of his career he was still you know still put in some match winning performances and genuinely cared which which was great um you know, David Miller had been there a long time, highly talented. Nicholas Poor, and it was his first year. I mean, I was only there the one season. Um, I said we'd, we'd finished last the year before, we'd made a few changes. And as I said, we were sort of one win away from making the playoffs. And um, But yeah, it was it was certainly time for me to, to move on at the end of that year. And then the call. And then, of course, you came to the best city in the world, according to me, best weather by a mile. People say the best dosas as well, but that's debatable. Um, what was it about RCB which automatically made you think, hmm, here we go now, Isala Cup Namde? Was it ever Isala Cup Namde? Come on, be of honest. Of course it was. Of course. I mean, I think it's got the, the potential to be such a talented group of, of players, so many passionate fans. I absolutely loved um, Chinnaswamy, you know, as a stadium and, and the, the intensity that it brought. Obviously, Virat Kohli, um, you know, I coached against him a lot, uh, you know, with New Zealand and, and, you know, he managed to, we got the better of him on a few occasions, but not many, you know, he was he was pretty damn good. So I guess the thought of, you know, working with him and AB um, with a team that was in desperate need of a bit of a bit of a shake up, um, you know, one that I was really passionate about, um, you know, Diageo, the, the owners were very much around, you know, running it like a business and, and allowing you to come in and, and build the team and, you know, make decisions, not ad hoc emotional ones, you know, which some franchises do. Um, try and be a part of something where we can actually build something um, and make informed decisions. And that was certainly, you know, what attracted me to RCB. Now, some people on the outside, Mike, think that Virat Kohli runs the whole show on RCB and I don't know if that's true or not but just shed light about when you went in there there was of course turbulence still no title still no title in 2024 as well which is absolutely shocking and painful in the heart quickly Isla Cup Tande this this year we're winning it right I would love to say that but I I would love to say that um but in all honesty I'm I'm concerned about RCB's bowling and, and that's um, that's just from a, a, a fan's perspective. You know, Chinnaswamy is an incredibly tough place to bowl. 
And you're asking a lot of your batting group to get truckloads every week. And, you know, Shami can't do everything. So, I'm, look, I live in hope. Uh, and I'm always an RCB fan, but I, I'm not so sure this is the year. But, hey, I'm happy to be proven wrong. You bet Siddharth's going to do everything, right? Correct. Did I not say Did I not say that? Show me. What did I say? Show me, did I? No, it's definitely Siraj, sorry. Yeah, Siraj. No, but just going back to that full RCB chat then with Virat and how things were run in that dressing room. Talk to me. We had a, a strong playing, I guess, a leadership group. Uh, obviously, Virat was part of that. Um, um, you know, we brought in Maxwell, who, um, you know, we felt could add to that that leadership group as well on the field. And AB and Virat are obviously huge mates and are incredible characters, and they are RCB. But we needed to to grow the group around them. And, you know, Virat was very much aware of that as well. Even the, even the narrative within RCB was always AB and Virat. And we needed to change that. You know, we needed to we needed to build some other heroes, some other people that the the fans and the, the opposition would be afraid of um, and respect. So, a big part of what we tried to do is is to bring in some some other people who could add to that leadership group and take the pressure off. Uh, but I'm always about shared leadership, and even though Virat is incredibly passionate about RCB and will give his heart and soul for it, we can't just rely on him to to do everything. So. Part of my job was to try and share the load a little bit and obviously involve him in many discussions, um, but also shared a bit of responsibility and try and share the load. And that was a big part of, of me coming in and, and allowing him to actually enjoy his cricket rather than be dragged down by, you know, the, I guess, the, the expectation that everybody has on him uh, and also RCB. Yeah, many people, in fact, believe that you're one of the best coaches to ever coach RCB. And if you guys don't believe me, just go check out that first podcast, which is available on RCB's YouTube channel. You look at the comments and everyone had positive things to say about Mike. The fact that Hessen is coach, he'll be great. Hessen Nana, Hessen Nana. You know, like just a pure love from Karnataka fans, Bangalore fans, RCB fans all over. I want to ask you about those nights of the Chinnaswami. Are we the best fans in the world? I'd say we because I'm a huge RCB fan since 2008. Oh, look, I think we are. Um, I think the... Just the, the... What's that? Did you just say we? Do you still believe yeah, that I, you're I, part look, of the I, we, but I think that, you know, I was with RCB for four years and, and I don't think, you know, I was with New Zealand for seven. I, you know, the teams that I've been with for extended periods of time, I, I, I do it because I feel a passion and a, you know, a real desire for that team. Um, and I don't think all of a sudden, just because you change, you... You know, you don't want that team to do well. That's just not that's just not the way I operate. Um, you know, I want I want RCB to to win the title for sure. Um, but I've also I'm also a pundit. I'm also you know someone that's employed to give their opinion, and I've I've got to be honest as well. And um, and but I, I think the fans at RCB are the most engaged fans in the world. Um, you know, I, I gave it everything uh, in those four years to 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 turn it around and and. We had a we had a couple of pretty good sniffs at, at, at trying to to win the title and and we couldn't quite get over the line and, and I'll you know I'm gutted about that um, but I've you know there's a few things that probably didn't quite go our way you know last year you know Rajat Padadar being out for the whole season Josh Hazelwood sort of missing for the the key part towards the end you know you, you can't sit out the start of the season wanting to win it you've actually firstly you've got to make the playoffs. Um, and then things start all over again. And that's, you know, that's the bit that I, there's a couple of opportunities we had a chance to, to get in the, the top two. And that obviously gives you a bit more of a lifeline. And that's probably um, the thing that I regret the most. I actually regret not playing more games at Chinnaswamy. Obviously we had we had a lot of seasons with COVID and a bubble. And then we had the transition. We were in, you know, we were in Mumbai and we were in Chennai. And we just didn't get to play enough at Chinnaswamy for my, my liking. So, uh, but the year that I had there, it was uh, it was pretty special. Yeah, special indeed. You mentioned a few Bangalore restaurants, we'll, which we'll get to in just a bit. But I want to ask you about some of the RCB dressing room vibes, right? Is Virat as vociferous as he is on the field, as off the field? Does Faf Duplessis actually, is he actually the hottest cricketer according to you? 
Well, I mean, we're we're at the IPL for probably sixty days, maybe more, and I think I think Fuff had his shirt off on all sixty of those days. Um, so I, I think he was a hundred percent on that. And would you blame him? What's that? Would you blame him because he's got a body if I had a rig like that, I'd walk around. In fact, I'd be doing this interview with my shirt off if I had a rig like that. He's um look, he's a good looking man, and he's actually he's actually quality human man. He's a quality human being, and and one that I'll I'll call a friend, you know, for the for the rest of my life. I think he's a you know he's a great human, and Virat's the same, um, but both very different in terms of how they go about things. Um, you know, Virat is he can go from really quiet to to full noise quite quickly. And he certainly grabs the attention of the changing room really quickly. And, and when he speaks, everybody certainly listens. Um, and that's because it comes from the heart. You know, he's, he's a real RCB man and, and, you know, he's stated that he always will be, and I'm sure he will. Um, you know, whereas Fuff is more, is more, I guess, concise and, and prepared in terms of what he says and, and how he says it. Um, but yeah, too, Two great leaders. Um, the the vibe in the RCB changing room is great. I mean, Siraj is is important. He's he's cheeky. Um, obviously, when Chahal was there, he was he was incredibly cheeky as well, and, and great fun to have have around. Um, you know, Vaishak, even though it was his first year, he certainly um, brought lots of passion to the changing room. You know, from a, a Connecticut point of view, um, and Dev was sort of that just that guy who sat in the corner and didn't say too much, but you know, just just smiled and um, was looking for the, the cutest girl to walk past, I think. We'll talk to Dave and a few other hidden gems, of course, uh, that you are not. And Dave was part of the whole KPL. I think you were doing commentary since then. And then you just said, you know what, I'm going to take a punt in this, lad. We'll get to that. But do you drink? Do you enjoy alcohol? Yeah, yeah, I do. I'm no, not a regular drinker, but I do. When I drink, I, you know, I have a couple and I, yeah, I enjoy it. So what you go for the normal KF Ultra Premium when you're in Bangalore, or do you go the wit beer and Actually, the large? Uh, um, Tanqueray, Tanqueray Ten drinker. Um, so yeah, Tanqueray Ten and tonic is my drink of choice. And I was lucky enough that Diageo were able to provide a few bottles to the team room on the odd occasion. So um, like I said, I you know I'm not a big drinker, but I'll, I'll have a couple of drinks to to enjoy a enjoy a victory with the lads. It's for sure. So the booze is always flowing in every IPL team. Right? That's the impression we get as outside from fans. That's why people say, why do you think they never start a game at 12 o'clock, bro? Because they're all too hungover. Do you resonate those thoughts? I mean, there's no doubt that, um, you know, after a, after a good performance that, you know, the guys sit around. Because you often don't get back to the hotel till 1 o'clock. So it's not like, you know, if you finish at 3, it's not like you've been there since 8 p.m. You've actually only just started, really. So, um, you know, there are some late nights, but... Not not boozy. Um, I think the guys are the guys are a heck of a lot more professional than they used to. That there's the odd exception, you know, guys that maybe um, stay up a little bit later than they should, but they only do that when they know they've got uh, a bit of time up their sleeve. Okay, I mean, talk to me about some of the players then at RCB because um, Yuzan Chahel, some RCB fans still miss him. He went out to say that the management was someone that he wanted to kind of talk to more and get clarity more before they pull the plug. How hard is it to take those decisions? And B, was there any communication given to UZ? Because he's probably in our top five players of all time, to be honest with you. Yeah, look, look, UZ was communicated with a huge amount. And, and I know that because I was the guy on the other end of the phone. So, um, you know, I spoke to UZ, obviously, when we did the initial retention and you know, we only retained three players because we we felt we we wanted to try and buy back both Harshal and Uzi at the auction. Um, and by only retaining three, it gave us an extra four crore to to try and do that. So not that meant that the that four crore came off the three that you retained. Probably the thing that that I'm really frustrated about even now is, as you said, Uzi was probably one of the top five players of all time for RCB, but he was he was also one of the best ever in the IPL. And the fact that he couldn't make the top two marquee lists at that time was was ridiculous. Um, and the fact that he came in number 65, I think it was, in the auction list uh, meant that that he was it was really difficult for us to guarantee we were going to get him. Um, and we, you know, that was something we'd we'd spent a huge amount of time at the mock auctions in terms of 
okay, because Harsha was in the uh, was in the marquee group, but but Yuzi was way down there, and we knew that um, through all our mocks that whether we got Harshal or not, um, and we want to get Harshal as well, he was the purple cap holder, um, is that we knew we could get bullied later on. Like, so if we if we saved all our cash and waited for set 12 or whatever it was for Yuzvendra Chahal, we knew there were five other teams that had more money than us. And if we let go of all the bowlers before that, and then we got to bidding for Yuzi, and everyone knew we were going for Yuzi, and we didn't get him. Um, we could have got bullied by five other teams and then been left with with no leg spinner. So it was a it was one that we'd spent hours and hours debating and trying to manipulate the the mock auctions of how we could potentially leave ourselves with with Yuzi. And we, we felt we needed to have a decent dip at Hasaranga. Um, obviously, the fact he was um, you know a three dimensional player. Um, you know, his batting for Sri Lanka had been really good at that time as well. Um, good player of spin and was, you know, was performing incredibly well on the international stage. So we felt that if we weren't going to get Yuzi, Hesse Ranga was, was a really nice option for us. Um, and I actually remember it vividly, the, the auction. Um, I think we bid, we bid 10.75, I think it was, and the auction in and we were going toe for toe with with Punjab and the auctioneer was staring straight at me with the the chairman had just raised the bat and he was staring straight at me and then he fainted and he passed out on the lectern fell off we actually thought he died and it was it was horrific and so therefore obviously the auction stopped so you know, once again, we'd gathered ourselves, and we'd already talked that, that was our last bid at that time. And and Pajab were just pretty much going straight back at us. But they basically had an hour then to rethink their strategy, came back in, didn't make another bid, and, and obviously we, we, we got Hasaranga, which we were delighted with, but we knew that obviously that would have flow-on effects. So it was um it was something that we tried really hard. And then I remember bringing Yuzi afterwards. He was, you know, he was upset and... You know, trying to explain to him the auction dynamics at that time was, you know, he wasn't interested, and and I don't blame him. You know, he was he was an RCB and he was frustrated, but um, you know, I can assure you, and and him, he's well aware that um, of the issues we were confronted with, and um, you know, obviously I was part of that decision making process, but I certainly wasn't uh, wasn't the only one involved in those discussions. And but Mike, you, but, but Mike, you look at this auction as well. If you were at that auction table, you're telling me you would have gone so much for Pat Cummins when you had 23 crores in the kitty. 20 crores, would you have done the same thing? I sure. never would have gone. I never would have bid for Pat Cummins to that level. Never, because you you basically show your hand then that that's as far as you can go. So therefore, you've got another two or three teams that know that that's actually all RCB's got. So as long as we keep that much or more in the auction. So they, they forego a lot of other auctions, a lot of other options in the auction to save more than 23 crore so that whatever RCB did or whatever, they could outbid them. So I think I think RCB showed their hands probably too much um, with the, the Pat Cummins move. And I can understand why they did it because once again, they didn't want to end up with nobody. And that's the that's the issue when you buy... Cameron Green at 17 crore, you don't go into the auction in a position of strength because you don't have more money than other teams. You know, we've been in some auctions where we've, we've bullied. Um, you know, we, we were able to get ourselves in that position through through releasing players. But I, I thought after the retention list, RCB were in a really strong position. And then obviously they spent 17 crore on Cam Green and, and Cam Green's a fine player, but it changed how they could how they could react in the, in the auction. It made, made a huge difference. How much does Virat Kohli play in the auction? In the sense, is he on the call with you? Is he telling you guys some names to get in? Because surely you're thinking Virat, Faf, that leadership group, they want to be involved and invisibly be there. Am I right? Oh, look, they're involved all the way through. But, you know, once you get to the auction day, um, the, the last thing you want is you know, too many distractions, but you do, you know, you still get, when you have your breaks, you still communicate with people and, 
and obviously that all the players are watching the auctions um, intently. And, you know, Virat and Faf are no different. So there's no doubt that they're sending through thoughts. Um, but also, as I said, you've spent weeks or months preparing and, and so many times you've built up, um, you know, uh, depth charts for different positions. So you, you also can't be emotive. If you're emotive in an auction, then you can get, you know, you can you can end up leaving the auction with nothing. And that's that's really important that you don't, that you're really strong in terms of how far you're willing to go for certain roles and how far you're willing to push. And if you can get some cheap ones early in the auction, that obviously gives you more money to spend on some of the ones further down. So it's always about pluses and minuses and trying to get yourself ahead of the ledger. Just to wrap up this auction chat then, Mike, really quickly, was there ever a player which slipped through the net in your eyes where you were like, damn, we should have got him. Damn, this guy would have made a huge difference to RCB, but he ended up going somewhere else. Oh, I think Tillich Verma was, was one where, um, you know, he was on our sort of scouting list um but we're, we're sort why of did identical. we get him we should have got him mike yeah we but at the time we, we, went for Rajid, was fine. we went for Rajid paradar at the time so it was like you know we needed to to make a decision on who we were we were going for um you know it would have been nice to have another left-hander in the top order there was a lot of talk that he was susceptible to the short ball domestically and no but um, but certainly since he's come to the IPL, he's made every post a winner. So I think he's one that um, you know I wish that we'd we'd pushed a little bit harder for. Um, all good in hindsight, but yeah, I think you know he's proven that he's a he's a high quality player. And being a left hander as well would always be helpful for that. You know that that RCB top order. Okay, uh, before we let you go, because I know we're just about over time, and just have to ask you a couple of rapid fire questions before we move on. And I'll start with RCB as usual. If you had to put one player as the best drinker, which had the most capacity in terms of alcohol, who is that? Well, I'm going to say AB de Villiers. Um, and just because I knew he drank, but you never ever saw him under the weather. You know, there's a couple of other guys who, who drank a bit and, and you could tell. Uh, but AB, he was always a very mature drinker and uh, I never... He, he was able to consume quite a bit, but you could never tell. Mike, you mentioned that, of course, you caught a little bit of football in Argentina. Are you a football fan? Yeah, I am. I'm a Liverpool fan. Um, oh, get out. Can we cut the interview? It's done. It's done, honestly. We had a couple of good years, but I uh, went through some pretty tough times during my early years, that's for sure. Have you ever hung out with MS Dhoni because he loves his shisha? Have you ever heard about him doing hookah? Have you ever gone, joined his room doing hookah? I haven't actually. No, I'm not a shisha goer. Uh, I have heard that he leaves his door open and and allows, you know, invites players to come in and and a lot of guys do that. But you know, I, was, I coached a lot against MS. Um, you know, had the odd brief discussion, but um, not not a huge amount. I've never been a part of a team that he's been part of. So, uh, but I've only heard good things. I mean, you know, Virat for one, um, you know, is hugely admirable uh, or admires, you know. MS and, and talks about it openly and, and even when we play against him he's you know in awe of what MS can do and the fact he continues to do it so uh, but no it hasn't hasn't stirred me into going along and popping in and having a shisha I'd, I'd probably just start coughing I reckon Finally then who would you put your money on to lead India for the next 5 to 10 years? I think in a couple of years time I think it's Shubman Gill I, I don't think they should do it any earlier than that I think uh, you've got to let Shubman find his own feet, and he, he certainly found it in ODI cricket. But you know, let him let him find his own path in Test cricket, um, same as as in T20s as well. He's good enough to be a a three format player, uh, and I think he's good enough to be a great captain. But just don't don't put it on him too soon would be would be my suggestion because he's got a he's got to find his own identity, and that, that's pretty hard to do when you're young. Okay, lastly, and the most important question of them all. How did you stumble upon us at cricket.com and how do you rate us so far? Well, there was a few posts last year, uh, you know, when you, you go back in the in the bus, you, you read a few things on Instagram and, and you guys actually made some sense. You know, you in terms of in terms of identifying um, you know, why we'd done well or why we hadn't. So there was actually some real sort of cricket intellect in it. And I'm probably one of those people that you know, I don't mind if somebody disagrees with what we've done or, or has a different view, as long as there's some rationale behind it. And I thought, um, I thought you guys at, at cricket.com 
were were smart. You know, you actually had put some work into it. You hadn't just been emotional in your response. You'd actually, uh, as I said, put some strategy behind it and tried to put yourself, tried to be empathetic enough to put yourself in those shoes and how you would do it differently rather than just give us a big thumbs up when we win and give us a big thumbs down when we lose. So there was a bit more intelligence. So I'll give you that one. Mike Hessen, it's been an absolute pleasure to pick your mind and hopefully we can have further interactions in the future. Given that you're going to win the PSL because you've been a successful coach in Argentina, Kenya, you mentioned Otego. Unfortunately, it wasn't to be with RCB, but speaking of RCB, when are we going to win the IPL next? 2024, 25, 26 or never? Oh, no, I certainly will. I think uh, I'm hoping 2025 will be uh, RCB's year. Get in there. Love you, Mike. Plenty of love from us in Bangalore, of course. And thanks for doing this because you've been an absolute legend in the first ever on Mind with Cricket.com.